Gary Player, a golfing legend with over 130 international tournament victories, now an even brighter star as he dominates the senior tour. No other golfer has ever approached Gary Player's record. He's one of only four golfers in the world to win the Grand Slam of golf, three-time winner of both the Masters and the British Open, two-time PGA champion, U.S. Open winner, and holder of 20 titles in Australia and South Africa. Today, he's a tournament favorite, enjoyed and respected by fans and fellow pros. He began his career as a teacher, and now he returns with his own unique approach to this special game of golf. What a fantastic game golf has been. It's enabled me to travel probably more than any other athlete, or certainly as much as any other athlete that ever lived, over six million miles, played in all corners of the world, met so many wonderful people, helped me to communicate, taught me great lessons of life, to have respect for people's views in life. And what a great education. I mean, I was uh, not lucky like a lot of people whose parents could afford to send them to college. But golf has been a greater degree than college. It's taught me about people, and I've seen things for myself all over the world. I started and used to give 50 cents or charge 50 cents for a lesson. And I used to make $60 a month for three years. And how grateful I am that I started off as somebody who is poor, because now when I win all these big tournaments, I really appreciate it. One thing that golf has taught me, there is not one way to play it. I've seen so many different swings, given so many lessons, so many great players, they all go about it differently, so there's not only one way to play it. Let me give you an example. Take Arnold Palmer. Stands there like this, has a big waggle, you know Arnold, he's a strong arm, swings it fast, follows through like that and gives it the old waggle like that doesn't worry too much about style. Then you see a man like Ben Hogan come out there, perfectionist, the scientist of golf. Flatter on the backswing, has a big hip movement and a nice big extended follow through. Another way of playing. Byron Nelson, great player, took the club back with no wrist break, broke it all in the downswing with a bit of a dip in the follow through like that. And many people say you mustn't dip. Then you take Sam Snead, one of the greatest, if not the greatest athlete that ever lived. The man won tournaments in his teens, and he won a tournament when he was 70. What an incredible athlete. At 70, he can still stand there and kick the door, the top of the door, which is quite unbelievable. He took the club inside the line and then up, had great tempo, wonderful follow-through, wonderful balance. So many different ways to play. Jack Nicklaus stood there, swings the club very upright, tremendous drive and strong legs, and hits the ball prodigious distances. So many different ways. I could go on and on mentioning all the different swings. Trevino, they tell you that you must aim at the flag. Trevino aims 50 yards or 100 yards left, takes the club outside the line, hits the ball with a big slice out there, ends up in the middle of the fairway. If you watch Trevino and Palmer together, you cannot believe it. Palmer hooks it, Trevino slices it, they start off 300 yards apart, but they end up in the same place. But what these fellas all did, each one of them, they took the club back, although they looked different like fingerprints, so many different people in the world and nobody with the same fingerprints. They all took it back in one piece for a start. Remember that, start your backswing in one piece. Gives you a nice wide arc. Number two, they had a good turn. All these great players had a good turn. Three, they started down with a delayed action. The initiation of the downswing is important. They started down with pulling that club down. Whether they pulled it with their left arm or whether they did it with their hips is another point. But they started down by initiating, by pulling down there like that. And number four, a good follow through with good balance and all the weight on the left side. Take Miller Barber, wonderful senior golfer. Stands there like this, gets that right elbow flying like that. He can almost look through the top of his arm and see you at the top. But he starts down beautifully and has been a very consistent player. But folks, remember one thing, that golf is a game of fun. You get a lot of strokes when you play golf. And those strokes you get have crippled more people than polio. I know I've got no chance playing against you guys. You tell me you're a 16 handicap, I've got to give you 19 strokes. I've got no chance. Have fun. We all get a bit nervous, naturally so. But have fun while you're doing it. It sure as hang beats the office. And folks, a very important point. Don't forget when you go out and play golf, so many people are hurt themselves. They either get a bad back and it puts them out of golf for a long time and a lot of discomfort, pull a shoulder, pull a 
elbow or tennis elbow or something happens and they hurt their wrist or their neck and it really isn't worth it, just try and loosen up a little. You come out of an air-conditioned car or an air-conditioned clubhouse, loosen up. Just before you play, take two clubs like this, hold them in your hand, any old grip, and just swing those two clubs that you can stretch those muscles. It's amazing how those muscles stretch. Stand there and just pull those knees up into your stomach. That'll help you loosen up those back muscles. Do anything you like, but don't go out onto the practice tee all stiff. Keep those knees bent. You must have bent knees when you bend over. Bend the knees and stretch your back down like that. Swing a few, even if you take those two clubs, and then to finalize, swing the left-handed. Loosen up those muscles. It's really worthwhile. I'd like to re-emphasize, have fun. You know, I don't know of any game where a six-year-old could go out and play. Just the other day, I played with a man in a pro-am in Palm Springs. He was 82 years of age, and he helped me on four holes. Man, that was really fun. Grip to follow through, the anatomy of the golf swing. There's no question the most important thing in the golf swing is the grip. You can have all the correct movements of your body. You can put the club on the right plane. You can hit through the ball. You can do all those things that are correct. But if you have a bad grip, you are never going to play consistent golf. Every great player I have ever seen, any player that has lasted a long time, has had a beautiful grip. Let me say this, the grip is quite complicated, and you can talk about the grip for 30 minutes alone. So we're going to try and give you the right grip and be as simple as possible. Now, the correct grip is this. This is the grip that suits every single player that, that plays the game of golf. The left thumb must be slightly on the right-hand side of the shaft. Just slightly on right-hand side of the shaft. This hand, the right hand, must run parallel with the left hand. You never want the hands fighting each other. You don't want this hand over there and this hand over there because that twists your body all out of position. The hands must work together as one unit. The left hand is gripped not in the fingers, not in the palm. It's a combination of both. There it is, slightly to the right hand side. Another very good tip, an easy way to remember, there's a line formed here between your index finger and your thumb. There's the line, very clearly indicated. And with your right hand, between your index finger and your thumb, there's the line. Those two lines must point at your right shoulder. So if you do what I said there and look down, that line there is pointing to my right shoulder. That line there is pointing to my right shoulder, and that's the correct grip. Now, if you want to hook the ball, then you've got to change your grip. Then you move your hands to the right hand side of the shaft like that, now you'll hook the ball. If you want to slice the ball, all you do is the opposite. You move your hands to the left hand side of the shaft like that, and your grip will be so weak that you'll get an automatic slice. When we're standing in a tournament and we've got to go around those trees, what we basically do is change the grip. If it's a slice, we weaken the grip. If it's a hook, we strengthen the grip, and it's as simple as that. Remember, another very good tip, when you stand at attention, there you are. Your hands are not twisted this way or twisted that way. Stand at attention and be relaxed. Put your hands out in front of you, and that's basically the correct grip. If you want to bring that club back to the ball square, you've got to grip correctly. Take my advice, and I mean this sincerely. This will really help your golf. When we're on the tour, invariably I'll say to one of my friends, just check my grip here. And I'll practice shots, changing my grip, cultivating feel. It's amazing if you change your grip, and some of you try this. Just change your grip half an inch, and you'll feel how awkward it feels. Visit your pro. If I've got a sore tooth, I go to my dentist. Go to your pro, have that grip checked. Sometimes people play badly for years. They try new clubs, they try different swings. But the trouble is at the heart of the problem, and that is the grip. Have it checked. To recap Gary's instructions, Remember to keep your hands parallel, left thumb slightly to the right of center. The V's formed by the thumbs and four fingers should point toward the right shoulder. Have your pro check your grip. If you ever want to test if your fingers are strong and you have a good solid grip, try hitting three drives without changing your grip whatsoever. Hit the ball, have somebody teed up for you, hit it again, teed up again, hit it, 
and see if your hands remain the same on the club as they were originally. That's a good exercise to work on your grip. I find the stance a very amusing part of the swing because it does contradict itself and I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's talk about the perfect stance. The ideal stance, let's say, with a wood and a long iron. The ball, as you can see, is opposite my left heel. There's the club running parallel to my left heel. There it is. My stance is slightly open. You should never really stand shut. The perfect stance is slightly open, aiming just a little bit left to the flag. If you watch all the best players on the tour today, they're inclined to aim just a little bit left. There it is. Stance a little bit left. Ball opposite my left heel. There it is. Knees flexed, nice and comfortable, with a little waggle to keep you relaxed. But, let me hit a shot first of all, showing you that stance. There it is. Which was a straight shot. Another lucky one. Now let's come to the part where I say that the stance contradicts itself. You play with Lee Trevino. He aims a hundred yards left of the target. Stands very open like that because he doesn't like to hook the ball. He likes to hit everything with a fade. So he stands, aims way left, takes it outside the line and cuts it like that with a nice fade. Then you take Arnold Palmer. He doesn't like to fade the ball. He and I both agree that we'd rather draw it. Most good players that we've seen do draw the ball. Now we aim a little right at the target and we make sure that we draw that ball when we hit it. If you draw the ball, it definitely goes at least 15 yards further than if you cut it. Then you take a man like Doug Saunders. Doug Saunders has a stance this wide. They say your stance should be according to the width of your shoulder. Doug is a Texan, we can forgive him. He can have a wide stance. He stands so wide like that, he only swings the club back to here, only follows through to there, and was one of the straightest hitters I ever saw, just there. And there. Then you take a man like Bobby Jones. What a wonderful golfer. What a wonderful gentleman. What a great example he set to many of us throughout the years. I think everybody's hero. Had a very narrow stance, particularly narrow, and had beautiful balance in his swing. He didn't like too wide a stance because he could transfer his weight well without losing his balance. And balance is a very, very important thing. Even though these fellas all had different stances, their balance throughout the swing was excellent. There have been some extraordinary cases when it comes to stances and disabled people playing golf. I played with a man in a pro-am the other day. You talk about an unusual stance. He came out onto the practice, onto the tee. We played in a pro-am. He played 18 holes this way with his crutches, put the crutch down, Stood there like this on one leg and went. Hit it like that. Got his balance there, bent down, picked his crutches up and played 18 holes that way and played to his handicap. Douglas Bader from Great Britain lost both his legs in the war, had artificial legs and played down to a single figure handicap, which was really a case of courage. Men play with one arm. I saw a man with an eight handicap the other day just playing with his left hand and then you get a man who's blind like Charlie Boswell who has such tremendous courage and every time Charlie sees you he doesn't really see you he hears you he starts talking to you how's your game great example of courage he said to me the other day he said what about us having our game I said Charlie that'll be great fun he, I said how many strokes do you want he says I don't want any strokes I said well what are we playing for he says we're playing for a hundred bucks I said, well, what are the conditions? He says, we're playing at my home course at midnight tomorrow. And there's a case of great example of courage. Many, many people can play golf in many different ways. Now, I'd like to come back to one more point about the stance. Let's re-emphasize the correct stance that we should all be striving for. The ball with your wood shots opposite your left heel there. The stance, as you can see my feet, are slightly left of the target line. I put this club here. In fact, it's a good idea to have it even closer to check on your alignment when you're taking the club back, that you're starting it back straight. Some people might be taking the club back too much on the inside. So a good little tip 
would be to put that club there because you cannot bring it back otherwise you'll hit the club and that's a good exercise to get you to go back nice and straight so this club serves a good purpose in having it right there to give you the direction of the backswing to start with of course eventually it turns and goes on to the plane now as you come to the shorter clubs and the medium clubs so the ball comes back just a little bit with your medium clubs it comes more or less about two to three inches inside your left heel with the shorter irons right in the center right in the center don't ever go putting the ball opposite your right leg with the short irons you don't need it you don't need to ever put the ball opposite your right leg so like so many people think they have to do the only time you put the ball opposite your right leg is when you're trying to go under a tree or you're playing in a very strong wind and you're trying to just keep the ball down low the stance and the grip are important as I as I re-emphasize and remember this if you can place the ball a man like Ben Hogan who was such a great golfer he placed the ball, as he says in his book, mostly in the same place because he said to chop and change the ball was difficult enough to hit it from one place, never mind chopping and changing it and varying the arc and the plane of your swing. So if you can keep that ball, I personally believe, and most of the top players are doing it, they're not changing the ball very, very much from that position just inside the left heel. Recapping Gary's instructions, remember to keep your stance slightly open Stance aimed just left of the target. Keep your knees flexed. Keep the ball positioned opposite your left heel. The backswing varies in appearance as well. You'll find somebody like Miller Barber, who is a very, very top senior player today, his right elbow will fly quite high on the backswing. You'll find even Jack Nicklaus when at his best. His right elbow used to fly considerably. Then you'd find Doug Sanders. His backswing would only go back to there. You'd find Arnold Palmer, who took the club back very shut and had a very shut position at the top. You'd find Lee Trevino, who took it outside the line, also a little bit shut. You'd find a man like Bobby Locke. He'd take the club way on the inside there. Sam Sneed took it back slightly on the inside. Byron Nelson took it back with very little wrist break and only sort of broke it on the downswing. So all these fellas had different backswings, but what they did do, they started the backswing back the same way. And this is what I'd like to see every one of you do. Don't make the backswing too complicated. Don't get paralysis of analysis in the golf swing. Start it back in one piece. Every great player that I've ever seen started the club back the first 15 inches in one piece like that. After that, they got into their own position which suited them. Have a good turn, make sure you've got a good turn, but by taking it back in one piece, it helps you to get a nice good turn and a good wind up which will enable you to release the club through the ball with great speed. Tempo, that depends on you. Lanny Watkins is fast, somebody else might be slow. Swing it according to your tempo, which is smooth. But I re-emphasize, back in one piece with a nice turn like that, and you'll put it in the right position. Here's a tip. The right elbow folds when it goes back. Watch the right elbow in slow motion here. It folds. Don't keep that right elbow going out there like that. The right elbow folds. So you start back in one piece, all in one unit, which gives you a nice wide arc, the right elbow folds with a nice full turn and then go ahead and let it fly. Points to remember and recapping Gary's instructions. Remember to start your backswing in a one-piece action. Take the club head straight back during the first 15 inches. Maintain a smooth tempo. Your right elbow should fold and remember to keep your head very still. Here's a quick tip for swayers. So many weekend golfers are always concerned about swaying. That is the question that's asked to me of all the questions by far the most. Right, take an ordinary plank of wood. Put it in at an angle, as you can see, it's at that angle there. Put your, dress the ball normal. Now, just take a swing. And that will really help you to tighten up your backswing. It'll prevent you from giving this, here's the sway. Look at that, look where my leg's gone, right across that piece of wood. 
So watch, there it is. Put it right against there. Don't even be concerned about it. Just swing the club now. Go through. Doesn't matter how much you go forward. What you don't want to do is go back when you're swaying because you go off the ball like that. You cannot possibly come back and meet the ball squarely. That little piece of wood has done wonders for many people. Having watched so many great players for so many years, I've often said to myself, well, to make it simple in the golf swing, what are the two things that every great player does? And having come to the conclusion, which I believe is this, they start the club back in one piece as they take the club back. The other thing is, just before they actually strike the ball, just before that club actually, the moment of truth, which I like to call it, because after all, the way you have that club at impact is the important thing. And that is, before impact, all the weight was on the left side. I have never seen a great player strike the ball with his weight on his right side. So the two things are, back in one piece on the start of the backswing, then they got into their own positions, and as they started down, they, all their weight was on the left side before they actually made contact. Think about that for a while, and that's something you can practice on the practice team. Now, the downswing. The downswing, of course, there are many ways to start the downswing. And this is where I want to try and help you and say to you, find out which suits you. There are a lot of people watching this instruction, and everybody is going to have a different feeling. Sam Sneed, when he gets to the top of his backswing, he starts his downswing by pulling down with the left hand. He pulls down with the left hand and pulls all the way through the ball. So it's one continuous motion, pulling down with the left hand, continuing all the way through into a nice good follow through and balance. Ben Hogan, he started the downswing from here by taking his left hip and turning it, clearing it out of the way. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's a great difference between clearing it out of the way and spinning the hip. Spinning the hip is when you keep your weight on your right side. You cannot spin your hip if you get your weight onto the left side. So what actually happens in slow motion, you get to the top, watch, the left hip moves a little bit lateral, and then it clears out of the way to give you a path and a free movement through the ball. That's what Ben Hogan did. That's what I like to personally do. That's what most of the young fellas on the tour are doing. However, some people haven't seen their knees in the last six years, and they cannot move the hips the way a young, slender guy can. So we give you another option. Tommy Armour used to talk about, from the top of the backswing, he used to say, take that right knee and kick it in. The first move from the top of the backswing, he kicked his right knee in, which is basically the same as getting your weight across onto the left side. Another way of doing it, people feel better if they have that strong right arm, so they get to the top and they take that right elbow and they pull that right elbow back into the hitting zone. They take the right elbow and pull it back into that hitting zone. Let me say this, the downswing is not a cast like a fisherman. You do the opposite of fishing. When you go casting, you're throwing the club. Golf is like pulling a rope from the sky. You, so you're pulling that rope and you're pulling it all the way through. See which way suits you best. See your pro, go over these little ideas with him and you'll find out which suits you the best. Here's a couple of good tips. Your hands are your automobile. There's your garage at the top of your swing. Now, you've got to take that automobile and park it in the garage. I want to re-emphasize that. Your garage is up at the top. Your hands are the automobile. Hit the ball and park the car in the garage at the top. Another good little tip. Imagine a piece of rope across the front of the swing here. Your club has got to smash right through that rope. Now I'll show you how some people swing. They have their cars parked in very strange garages. They go back and they stop there. Oh, that's, that's the, that garage is in the basement. Watch this. Or they go out to Kansas City, out there. So you've got to make a point of parking it in the garage right through the ball. Watch all these young players on television. Watch them carefully. Don't just be interested in seeing where the ball goes. Watch how they finish that shot with good balance, striking right through the ball. 
It's the first 20 years that are toughest, folks. You've got nothing but time. I've stressed the importance of hitting through the ball with good balance. This is what we do not want to do. The old weekend golfer, he watches the pros play. He goes back to his club. He says, now I've got it. And once he addresses that little ball, he tightens up. And of course, his idea of hitting through the ball with good balance is this. He goes, there. Now, once the ball's gone, then he gives this lovely big high action. <laughs> and that's what we want to avoid. To recap Gary's instructions, start the downswing with a downward pull of your left hand. You should move your hips laterally, shifting your weight to the left side. Remember, it's like pulling a rope from the sky. Don't cast your downswing. Park your car in the garage. Continue the action through the ball, maintaining a good balance. We're always hearing people saying, well, he's got a beautiful swing. He's got a great style. I don't know what a good swing is, really, and I don't know what great style is. When I think of the 10 best players that ever lived, they all have different swings. The one that's good is the one that works. It's the bottom line that counts. Let me show you Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer stands there. The wind's blowing. A lot of golfers pick up the grass and they throw it up in the air. And I said to the player the other day, why do you do that? He says, well, all the good players do it. Arnold Palmer's a little different. The TV's on him. Big arms, the most charismatic golfer I've ever seen. Wind's blowing, opens up his shirt, picks out a hair and throws it up and see which way the wind is blowing. Stands there like this, doesn't really worry about style. He has those big, strong hands. And you see him give that waggle there like this. And he hasn't worried about too much about tempo. You see Arnold standing there like that and he's hitching the old pants up. Then you get Lee Trevino stands there at the British Open. He's got a four shot lead with two holes to go, gets a seven on the 71st hole. Now he's only got a one shot lead, his first British Open, the TV commentators are there commentating on him and before he can even have anything more to say, this commentator, Lee Trevino's hit already. Gets on the, first, on the tee in the last hole, needs a five to win, not an easy hole. He's teeing it up there and he says, now can you imagine, I've got a chance to win my first British Open and here I'm getting a seven on the hole and he's talking while he's swinging. Well, I mean, everybody couldn't get over that and the ball still went right down the middle. These fellas have done so much for golf. Nicholas, Chichi Rodriguez, a host of number of players. Chichi Rodriguez one day is sitting in the stand, he tells me. He calls himself a hot dog pro. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, I was playing the other day, and these people are in the stand. And I'm coming up there, and they said, well, who's coming up now? And they said, oh, this is Arnold Palmer. Well, we've got to watch Arnie Baby finish. And they watch him finish, and then Nicholas is coming up, and they say, who's coming up now? This is Jack. Well, we'll watch him finish as well. Who's this coming up now? Chi-Chi Rodriguez. Oh, let's go get a hot dog. So he calls himself a hot dog pro. But here's a little man who is tiny, doesn't weigh 130 pounds, hit the ball prodigious distances with great speed. And remember, folks, for those of you that are small, we all know that the big man can hit it a long way. But for a little encouragement on small men like Chi-Chi and myself, you get club edge speed and distance on the ball by moving your body and your hands quickly through the ball. This is the answer. You've got to try and get those hands and your legs, everything moving through the ball with great speed. Watch the speed on the shot, but keeping it smooth on the backswing. Speed, that's what gives you the distance. We all have times where we get a little bit of confused in our swing and we get that, what I say, paralysis of analysis. So uh, here's a little check. Remember the four-piece swing. This will help you. This will put all the fundamentals basically into four pieces. Here we go. Start the back swing. One piece. One. Hips and shoulders turn. Two. Three. You pull down with the left hand. Four. Into the follow-through with good balance. Let's just do that one more time. The four-piece swing. One. Back in one piece. Two. Two. Hips and shoulders turn. Three, pull down with the left hand. Four, into the follow through with good balance. I hope it helps you. Now let's take a complete look at Gary's golf swing.
I did mention that when you want to hook and fade the ball, that you've got to alter your grip. That is the most important thing. To recap, if you want to hook the ball, you just strengthen your grip, you put the thumb on the extreme right-hand side of the shaft, and you put that right hand underneath the shaft there like that, as though you're riding a BM motor, motorcycle. You know, you get those old wrists really working there. Get them underneath there. Now you've got a strong grip, that'll enable you to draw the ball or hook the ball. Now, at the same time, you've got to adjust your stance. You take your right leg, of course, the straight shot, everything is aiming at the flag. Now we want to draw that ball, so you've got to shut your stance, close your stance, in other words, draw your right leg behind your left leg, and you aim to the right of the target. You also will then take the club on the inside a little bit, and you'll swing inside to out, and you'll get your hook. Now you want to play the slice. Weaken the grip now. Don't forget, weaken the grip. Stand open this time. In other words, this time you put your right leg in front of your left leg. You aim to the left of the target, which enables you to take the club outside the line and cut across the ball, and that's how you'll get your, your slice. Those little shots are very important because there always seem to be trees in the way, except at St. Andrews. Uh, you just never see any trees there, but you still even there you have to hit some hooks and slices. I'll hit a few shots now. I'll hit two shots with a hook and two shots with a fade. There's the normal stance, standing absolutely square, everything facing the target. Normal grip. Now, we're going to make our grip stronger. Move it to the right, both hands. Draw the right leg back of the left leg, aim to the right of the target, take it inside the line, and there's the hook, inside out, and automatically your wrists will roll over the club, and the club face will shut, and the ball will hook. Now we want to play the fade or the slice. Now we do the opposite with the hands. We weaken them this time, move them over to the left-hand side of the shaft, and that one as well, both hands. Stand open, in other words, we're aiming to the left of the target. Take the club outside the line, cut across, and there is the fade or the slice. And the hands this time do not cross over like they did with the hook. They stay this way, and they come underneath, and the club face faces the target all the time or to the left of the target and never rolls over which gives you a nice fade. These are shots you should spend a little bit of time practicing. I'm not going to apologize for nagging you because we all have to be nagged at this game to get it right. Here's the other hook and here's the other fade. Normal stance, normal grip. Left hand to the right, right hand to the right, right hand or right foot behind the left leg, pardon me, Take the club inside the line, and you'll roll your wrist over, and you'll get that hook going from right to left. Now the fade, or the slice, the opposite. Move the left hand to the left, right hand to the left. Stand open this time. Take it outside the line. Cut across the ball, and you get your fade. A recap on the hook. Your grip should be strengthened. Maintain a closed stance as you aim right of the target. Your swing should be inside to out. Let's recap Gary's instructions on the fade. Remember to weaken your grip. Maintain an open stance. Be sure to aim left of your target. And execute the swing outside to inside. I do a lot of golf clinics all over the world and we always do our little surveys and we ask the people to put their hand up for those that are slicers and those that are hookers. And I can assure you the slicers far outnumber the hookers. So here we are. We want to give you a good little tip to get rid of that slice. Just a quick little tip. What actually happens with the average weekend golfer? Of course, there are a lot of weekend golfers that play five times a week, but in spite of that, they do not learn to use their hands with any speed whatsoever. They go through the ball and they block the shot. They have no idea on how to release and get club head speed through the ball. If you watch all the great swingers of our time, you'll see how the club head releases right through the ball instead of at the ball. There's a great difference between hitting at the ball and hitting through the ball. Take your feet and put them together. Keep them right together and just hit a few five irons like this. This eliminates the body to a large extent and makes you use your hands. There we go. It eliminates you using a lot of body. Now you just use your hands. And that is a great tip to really get speed with your hands 
and get the feeling of releasing the club head through the ball and that will really help you to get rid of that old terrible slice. Of course, if you're at a golf club that has all dog legs to the right, you got it made. And now let's go with Gary out onto the course for some practical application. So many players today could save themselves numerous strokes if they played the right shot at the right time. For example, if we took a man who was about a 16 to an 18 handicap and I could go out and caddy for him, I know that he could play to about a 12. I would make sure when he's going uphill on a putt, I'd say, look, get it past the hole, get it up, you into the grain. I'd tell him when he's got a six iron and he know, I know he should be hitting a five iron. That would save him a stroke to keep the ball in play, when to go for the green, when not to go for the green, to keep his cool. There's so many things that I get, so many examples. And that's why uh, when you go and watch a golf tournament, don't merely stand there and watch the flight of the ball. Watch the shot that the fellows are playing. Watch when they go for it. Watch when they're playing safe. Watch when they're in trouble, how they get the ball back onto the fairway. You know, one of the worst things is when you see people hit a bad driver, a real rank bad driver, and they're in the trees, and they don't want to take the punishment. You have to take that punishment. If you're in those trees, and the best example I can think of, when I finished second to Lee Trevino in Alabama, I came to the last hole and I put the ball in the trees on the right. I was very tempted to shoot for the green with a three iron because there was a gap. Had I done that, I might have made a seven. Instead, I decided to chip back onto the fairway, knock my third shot onto the green and hold the putt to tie for second, which meant an awful lot. So course management is essential. We're going to talk a little bit about wind shots here and about keeping the ball low and high just in general because these little shots always come in handy at some time or other. Let's say, for example, I'm playing in the wind. I think the hardest thing when playing in the wind is to keep the ball low and hit it straight at the same time. Here's a good tip. If the wind's into your face and you've got a six iron to the green, don't try and hit that six iron low and try and hit it straight at the same time. Don't use the six iron, take out the five iron. Instead of hitting a full six iron, all you do is grip that five iron down the shaft and just hit a normal, easy little shot. Now by doing that, it's gonna go low automatically. It's hard enough to try and hit it straight, never mind hit it low as well. So the fact that you're hitting a five iron or just gripping down on a five iron and hitting a little easier into the wind, it's gonna keep it low automatically. When you're playing into the wind, and you hit a full six iron, if that is the distance, or for that matter, any time you hit a full shot into the wind, the ball is going to balloon up into the air and you're going to lose all control of it. I know when we play on those Scottish links at the British Open, sometimes you'd have a six iron distance and you'll see these fellas take out a four iron and just an easy little four iron and it automatically keeps it low. That's a very simple tip. Now, when you want to play, let's say on a calm day, you want to hit the ball a little lower, what you've got to do then is make certain the ball is positioned in the center of your feet or a little bit towards your right foot. And at the same time, when playing this shot, the setup is very important. What you do is keep your weight on that left side. This is for the low shot under a tree, or if you just feel you want to hit a low shot, you feel more comfortable, keep the weight on the left side, put the ball back in your stance, and just swing normal. And that ball will go low for you. Now you want to hit it high, you do the exact opposite. You now position the ball opposite your left foot and you keep your weight more on the right side. So you're setting yourself up more under the ball. This will hit it higher for you. Weight more on the right side, ball opposite the left foot and just go ahead and have the normal swing. And of course, the flight is so completely different. Those are such easy tips without getting all complicated and making it difficult for you. Once more, the low shot, just keep your weight on the left side when playing the shot, ball off the back foot or towards the center, and swing normal. The opposite for the high shot, weight on the right side, ball off the left leg, and go ahead and hit it, and it'll go high automatically. To recap Gary's wind shot instructions, first hitting low, remember to position the ball back toward your right foot, and keep your weight on your left side. To hit the ball higher, position the ball opposite your left foot and keep your weight on your right side. Easy. 
Well, folks, this is not our favorite spot for any golfer to be in the rough. Uh, I must say, when I think of a great rough player, I think of a man like Jack Nicklaus. I remember playing in the U.S. Open at Bell Reeve that I won in 1965. We put the ball in the rough. I could only hit it about 60 yards. He took out an 8-iron and hit it 140 yards right over the creek onto the green. Now, the way you play the shot is, first of all, to make sure you do not hit it fat or do not hit behind the ball, because if you do that, you're going to get no distance, no results whatsoever. So to enable yourself to do that, you've got to set the club a little earlier. You've got to pick it up a little steeper, because if you take the normal swing, you're going to catch all this grass behind the ball. So you pick it up a little steeper by setting your wrist earlier. You take that left hand and you pull it down, and you try and hit the top of the ball. Do not hit behind the ball. Hit the top of the ball, and at the same time, get through the rough as best you can. I'll give you a shot and show you. Every person on the golf course can feel the tension. His player hits his drive on 16. His drive is off the fairway, and he has a very difficult shot to the green. At that stage, I've got 150 yards to go. I couldn't see the flag. I had to pick out a spot through this willow tree, and I could just see the flag, and then I... When I got to address the ball, I couldn't see the flag, so there was a, one of these um, seat sticks underneath my, uh, on my line. So I just aimed right over that seat stick, and I've got 150 yards to go, and I've got to hit a 9-9. Well, it's either in the water or it's going to be close. As Player said later, it was one of the greatest shots he had ever hit. Then silence settles over 16. If Player makes this four-footer, he's got this PGA Championship tournament all locked up. He makes it. Gary Player birdies the hole to retake a two-stroke lead. As he put it later, 16 was definitely the hole that won the tournament for me, without a question of a doubt. So it's all but over as player arrives on 18. You've just had a long drive 250 yards down the fairway and landed in a divot. Every time I play a tournament, I can't help but walking down the fairway and thinking to myself, how on earth don't we hit more drives in the divots? After all, most of the players competing in that field, and let's say approximately 150 players, they're all driving very much in the same area, so that means they're all hitting their iron shots from the same place, virtually. Uh, when I think of divots, it reminds me of the story. Somebody was telling Sam Sneed one day how great Hogan was and how straight he was off the tee and how he hit that drive time and time again. In fact, he hit it so straight, he often ended up in the same divot as yesterday. And Sam Sneed turned around and said, if he was that straight, why didn't he hit it to the right or the left? But the thing is this, that Playing this shot, none of us are very happy to end up in a divot, but it's going to happen to you whether you like it or not. And thank goodness for the good green keepers we have all over the world that manicure those golf courses and keep them in the shape that we like to see them. Playing this shot here, basically, you've got to make sure that your hands are in front of the ball. You do not want to have your hands behind the ball. If they're behind the ball, you're going to hit behind the ball at address, and you're going to hit it fat, and you're going to get no distance. The most important thing in this shot is to hit the ball cleanly. Do not hit it heavy. Do not hit it fat. Almost get the feeling as though you top it out of, a, out of a divot. It's very similar to that as a fairway bunker shot. Do not hit behind the ball. So I'm putting my hands in front. I'm actually closing the face just a little bit to make sure that my hands are even forward a little bit more and hit the ball first and get through it. It really is a shot that looks far more difficult than it really is. Don't be intimidated by being in a divot, and don't be upset when you get in a divot because it's gonna happen, except the rub of the green. A recap on points about the divot. Remember to position your hands in front of the ball. The club face should be closed slightly as you strike the ball cleanly. You know, another good point I'd like to mention as far as course management is concerned. The most difficult shot for the average weekend golfer to play is a one iron, a two iron, and a three iron. 
As far as I'm concerned, you don't have to have those in your bag. Get a five wood, get a six wood, get a four wood. It's so much easier. I personally carry a five wood because it can help me to get the ball out of the short rough. I can get it out of a bunker. I can get it out of a divot. I know one thing, it's very difficult to hit a one iron and a two iron out of those lies. So don't be embarrassed to carry that five wood. Get a little club that's going to get the ball out of the rough for you. There's been so much said about slopes, and it can be very complicated, so I'm going to try and make this as easy and to the point as possible. Whichever way the ground slopes, that's the way the ball is going to go. In this particular case, the ball is below my feet, the ground is sloping away from me, so therefore the ball is going to go to the right. You don't make any adjustment in your actual swing, you just come a little closer to the ball, aim a few yards left of the flag or the fairway, and go ahead and hit it and let the ball slice naturally towards the target. This time we have the complete opposite slope. This time the ball is sloping down towards us. So the ball is going to go to the left this time. What you do is the opposite. You grip the club shorter this time, also come a little bit closer. Instead of aiming at the target, aim to the right of the target, go ahead with your natural swing, and the ball is going to hook and come into the target. Because the ground is sloping this way, the ball is going to go this way. On this particular slope now, the ball is sloping right away down towards the flag, so the ball is going to go much lower. So the adjustment you make here, you put the ball towards the center of your stance. You must keep it in the center of your stance, otherwise you'll hit behind the ball. And all you do is, if you've got a six iron to the green, take a seven iron because it's going to hit it so much lower and the ball is going to roll a little bit more and the seven is going to automatically turn into a six iron. Same swing. Don't change your swing. Just your ball position towards the center of your feet and go ahead and have your normal swing and keep your head very still on this shot because if you sway back off the ball, you'll never come back to the ball square. Of the four different slope positions, I feel this is the most difficult. The reason I say that, because you're hitting up against the slope and it's very hard to get your weight back onto the left side and follow through because of this severe slope. There again, the slope is going up this way, so the ball is going to go higher, obviously. So if you've got a four iron to the green, you take a three iron. Or if you've got a six iron to the green, you take a five iron. Position the ball in the center of your feet, in the center. Make certain that you try and get your weight across as much as possible to the left side and have a good follow through. As you can see now, I've finished that shot and all my weight is on the left side. That's not easy. Let's recap the points to remember concerning the slope. First, a slope where the ball is below the feet. You'll want to aim the ball left of the target and allow for a natural fade and a loss in club distance. Remember these points if the ball is above the feet. Aim the ball to the right of the target and allow for a natural hook. Easy. The downhill line. Remember to position the ball in the center of your stance and do allow for more distance than normal. The uphill lie. Position the ball in the center of your stance, keep your weight on your left side, and allow for less distance than normal. Every time you hit a shot, you've got to accelerate that club into the ball. It doesn't matter whether it's a six inch putt or a 300 yard drive. You've got to accelerate through that ball. And I'd love to give a tip to all my young friends that are taking up golf and that are very active at the moment. Play well. Play like gentlemen. There's an old saying that's so true that manners maketh a man. If you watch most of the top players today, when the referee comes along and gives them an example or says to them, you've got to drop it there or you penalize a shot or two, they take it like men. Don't fight. Don't lose your tempers. Keep the golf course tidy. Don't throw cigarette butts all over the place. Take pride in your golf course. Everybody at your club loves your club. Help them to do the same. When I played golf in Japan a lot, I really think that it taught me a great lesson in that if you really want to improve your golf, the best way to do it is by spending more time on your short game and less time on the long game. If you watch the Japanese golfers, they always seem to be chipping, playing bunker shots, playing wedge shots, and in other words, 
they're turning three shots into two. By that I mean from 100 yards, they're taking two to get down instead of three. Now, if you watch in the Western world, so many of the young people or at golf clubs, they spend so much time on the driving range beating a lot of golf shots and not improving their short game. This is what I call the bread and butter club. The wedge is that bread and butter club. That is the club that gets you that bread and butter. That's the tournament that is won uh, by one stroke where you turn the three into two. The old wedge is the club that does it. When playing this wedge shot, I think you've got to create feel. You've got to have nice tempo in the shot. You need feel. It's not a shot where you need strength. Anybody can play the wedge well with the correct method. Not a lot of body is used in this shot. I make certain of hitting the ball first. In fact, that is the prime thing when playing this shot, to get the backspin, to get the control of the flight, hit the ball first and then the turf. Do not hit behind the ball. Invariably, the poor greenkeeper gets the blame that the greens do not hold because the fellas are hitting behind the ball instead of meeting the ball first. And at the same time, you want to feel that club going through the ball. So here I am trying to hit the ball first and hitting through. That was a good illustration. Here I am playing the shot downwind. There's quite a strong wind behind me, and yet the ball stopped reasonably well. And it's middle of the day, so the greens are not all that soft. Hit the ball first and watch the follow through. What I like to do in practicing is draw a circle round the hole, and unless I put, and I put that circle at round 15, 12 to 15 foot, and unless I can put X amount of balls in there, I don't leave that spot. You've got to make the practicing interesting, and don't leave until you've achieved your object. Not a lot of body, keep it smooth, hit the ball first, and make sure you follow through. That looks like a good one in the air. Folks, don't hit too many long shots. Spend a lot more time on the short game. Let's recap Gary's wedge instructions. Strike the ball first, keeping your stroke as smooth as possible, and maintain a good follow through as you use less of your body. In 1959, when I won my first British Open at Muirfield in Scotland, I don't know whether I was lucky or not, but in the evenings, the stays light for so long up until 10.30 to 11 o'clock at night. But I used to walk down on the beach with a club and I started hitting a few balls and then I increased my practice on the beach. And I really firmly believe the reason I won that British Open was because I hit a lot of balls off the beach with my middle irons and my short irons. Now, a good teacher, as we've said, is a man who can communicate, a man who can impart feel to you to the best of his ability. Now, this old sand here, this sand is the greatest teacher in the world for a full wedge shot. It doesn't talk to you, but in the meantime, it does talk to you. In other words, if you're playing a full wedge shot out of this sand, if you hit it slightly fat, if you hit behind the ball, the ball's only going to go half the distance. So this will make you hit the ball first. And after all, that's what I said a little while ago, that the prime thing in playing the wedge shot is to meet the ball first and not hit behind it. So now I'm going to play this shot and make absolute certain that I meet the ball first. If I hit behind it, if I hit just a quarter of an inch behind, the ball is not going to take off in the way it should do. Now there's one that I hit behind and it's only gone, well, 65 yards. Got to hit the ball first. Aim at the top of the ball and get that club going through. Remember I said to you, hit the club going right through the ball and meeting the ball first. In slow motion, here we go there. You come down and you meet that ball first and right through the ball. If you hit behind it, you'll know all about it in the sand. Slightly behind again. Actually, the perfect way to do it is to have a lake or some water and play the shot over the water and that will really force you and help you to hit that ball first. So what it's actually doing by playing this 
wedge shot out of the sand, it's imparting a feel to you that nobody can do as well verbally. I guarantee you folks, you spend five minutes a day to ten minutes a day practicing your wedge shots off the sand, you'll find the biggest improvement that you've ever had in your life with your wedge. Fear strikes the hearts of grown men and women when suddenly they find themselves in the sand. Now Gary shows us how easy it is to get out of the sand trap. Back on 15, player makes a nice out. I can think of many good trap players like Sam Sneed, Julius Boros, Chichi Rodriguez and a host of others and uh, they basically played the shot the same way and the most important thing when playing the sand trap shot is to feel that your club is accelerating through the ball. You can see how that club is accelerated through and did not decelerate into the ball. A typical weekend golfer playing a trap shot, they stand there and they take a hard swing and they hit deep into the ball and of course leave it in the trap. It's not a case of how hard you hit, it's a case of good tempo and your club accelerating through the ball. Do not quit on the shot at all. Now, there are certain ways to stand which are important and I feel that your feet must be in that sand. You must dig your feet in that sand for the simple reason if you don't do that, whilst on your backswing your feet will actually sink into the ground and you'll lose all control of the shot. So your feet must be buried in the sand, dug into the sand with a nice firm footing I think your weight should be favoring your left side and then on the backswing the club should be set a little early, a little earlier than normal and then of course you must get through the ball with some speed. Some players like Sam Sneed played a little bit slower, he had a longer swing and slower which is a fine way of playing if you can, if you got the nerve to do that. A man like Doug Ford, who was a very good trap shot, and many of the Japanese players like Aoki, they have short little swings and are crisp on the shot. So everybody has their own way of playing it, but they all get through the ball and keep their head very still whilst playing the shot. We'll just go over a few pointers again, which are of importance. Get the feet in the sand, stand a little bit open, facing to the left of the target, in other words. I don't think it's necessary to take the club way outside the line like a lot of people advocate. If you stand open, I think that's sufficient. Open the club face, set the wrist a little earlier, and feel that the club is going through the ball. In other words, accelerating through it. Recapping the sand shot, first the normal sand shot, remember to dig your feet into the sand. Maintain an open stance. The club face should be open. Set your wrist early. Your strike should be one to two inches behind the ball. Accelerate through the ball. Now if we want to play a low shot, we have to set up, could you throw me those balls back please? If you want to uh, hit a low shot, which you have to do in sand sometimes. You don't open the club face as much anymore. You keep the club face more square and the ball goes more towards the back foot. This time, because the club face is square and off the back foot, the ball will go out with a much lower trajectory. Now, we want the opposite sometimes when the flag is just behind the trap. Now we want the opposite. We open the club face to a great degree, right off the left foot, now the weight favors the right foot because you want to get it sort of scooped up in the air. And you can see how that has gone straight up. Let me re-emphasize that again. For the low trap shot, you might say to yourself, well, when do you play the low trap shot? You play the low trap shot when the flag is right at the back of the green, reasonably long way away, 20 yards or so, and you have lots of green to work with. Put the ball center towards the back of your foot, 
with a club face very square, not open, and the ball is going to, as you can see, come out a lot lower. Now you want to play the high shot. When do you want the high shot? When the flag is just behind the, the edge of the lip of the trap, and you've got to stop the ball quickly. It's a complete opposite. Ball opposite the left foot. Weight favoring the right foot. Club face, extremely open. And then accelerate through the ball, and that is also popped up in the air. For the buried lie, this is going to happen a lot. Personally, when we design golf courses, we like to make our bunkers as firm as possible. We do not believe in soft, fluffy bunkers. By keeping the bunkers firm and not too much sand in, you can play a much better type of shot. However, some courses do have the soft, fluffy sand and the ball buries a lot. What you do with the buried lie, keep the ball in the center of your feet. Do not open the club face. Keep the club face square. Do not worry about following through on this shot. Hit down into the ball, a couple of inches behind, just hit straight down, and you can see that ball will come out with a lot of topspin. When you have a buried lie, like that, or a fried egg, remember you cannot get backspin. It's impossible to impart backspin on this shot. So therefore, we've got to allow for the ball to roll a little bit more than normal. Club face is not open anymore. Hit straight down. Don't worry about the follow through at all. And that ball will pop out of there with a lot of topspin. This is a very important shot. If you can play your bunker shots well, folks, it encourages you to attack a lot more. I know when I won those major championships and I've come down the line and they've got those flags behind the corners of these traps, it's never worried me to a great degree. It's never encouraged me to play safe. And therefore, when you're playing safe under pressure, coming down the last few holes, you're not going to be a winner. I used to attack those flags because I wasn't scared of the bunker. I had confidence in getting it out of the bunker, getting it out in two, maybe even holding the occasional one. So not only does it help your play out of the sand, but it helps you psychologically. Spend some more time in the sand. Get the nickname of Lawrence of Arabia. Here we have a different view for you to actually see the ball and a more exaggerated movement of the backswing and follow through because it's a little longer shot. Well, folks, that's the best I can do right there. Recapping the playing of a low sand shot. Keep the club face square. Position the ball toward your back foot. Your weight should be toward your left foot. Recapping the playing of a high sand shot. The club face should be open. Position the ball toward the front foot. Your weight should be toward your right foot. And accelerate through the ball. Here's a recap on the buried lie. The club face should be square. Position the ball to the center of your stance. Your weight should be toward your left foot. Hit down with no follow through and do allow for extra roll. Very few shots in golf are as crucial as those in the short game. I cannot emphasize enough how important the short game is. Let's take, for example, if I had to go and play tomorrow with a man who has a 16 handicap, and I had hit all the shots from 100 yards in, and he hit all the long shots, I can guarantee you that man's handicap would drop immediately from a 16 to about a 7 or an 8. So that really makes you think and appreciate the value of the short game. When chipping this little shot off the edge of the green, the weight must be placed on the left side. The reason being, it stops you from swaying and getting a lot of loose movement with the legs. Secondly, the hands must be in front. I've never seen a good chipper with his hands behind the ball. Weight forward, hands also forward, and watch how the club hits the ball on a downward blow. It's struck on a downward blow, which gives you a nice solid shot. Some people chip with the wrists a little bit, some people chip stiff wrists. You find that the Japanese, who are playing on a rough type of grass called Korai grass, or when we first started, we played mainly on Bermuda, one had to use the wrists a bit more because the greens were so slow. 
but that doesn't matter whether you're stiff wrist or wristy. Long as you make sure your weight is forward, your hands are forward, and the left wrist does not break down. This is of utmost importance. Watch the left wrist as I strike the ball. You can see that left wrist has not altered the position at all. As it was at a dress, which is there, so it is there when it strikes the ball. The bad chippers are the people that do this. Take note, watch the left wrist. That's the bad chipper. There he's got the breakdown of the left wrist. Here's a little exercise for it. Put that butt of the club right against your arm and now hit the shot and make sure that butt stays there. That went right in the hole. There's the left wrist, never moved. So practice that a lot. At the same time, keep your head absolutely still. Don't be in a hurry to pick the head up. Keep it down until the ball is gone. Often you'd explain to somebody who's never played golf, you say the closer you get to the hole, the more difficult the game is. If you've got a putt this long, it's tougher than hitting a drive on the fairway for some unknown reason. The reason being one gets nervous. The nerves play a far greater part on a short putt than on a long drive, as we've seen many famous golfers get the freezers on the short shots. Obviously, I'd like to see a man use a putter from here. Don't be embarrassed to use your putter from three, four yards off the green. It's a sure way of getting that ball close up to the hole. Also, if you ever have a choice of running the chip up or hitting a lofted shot, always hit the run-up shot. Use your five iron, use your six iron, your seven iron. The only time you play the lofted shot, which we will come to in a few minutes, is when you have to play over a trap, over water, or over a ridge or up a bank. Use the run-up shot. That is the safest. Let's recap Gary's chipping instructions. First, the chip and run. Keep your weight on your left side. Your head should be in front of the ball. Keep your head very still. Strike the ball downward. Your left wrist must not break down. Gary recommends the use of your putter when you can. This little loft shot or the high pitch shot from off the edge of the green, just over traps, just over water. There's no question about it, I think is a very difficult shot. It is a shot that you members, weekend golfers, find particularly difficult. I think the best at the shot that I can think of is Aoki from Japan. Now this man plays the shot with a lot of wrist. When you're playing the shot off the edge of the green, you can play it stiff wristed. You can putt stiff wristed. But this lob shot, I don't think you should ever play it stiff wristed. So what I'm going to do here is put the ball directly opposite my left foot. It must be opposite the left foot because you want to hit it on the upswing. You want the ball to go high. The other thing is you've got to open that blade as much as you possibly can. And secondly, it's cocked the wrist, or thirdly, I should say, you've got to cock the wrist, get a wrist break on the backswing. That enables you to get some club head speed uh, through the ball and hit the shot with some authority. So here we go, off the left foot, cock the wrist, and hit the shot with some authority. Watch how the club is accelerating into the ball. There's no decelerating. The average golfer gets up there, he puts the ball off the left leg, he opens the club face, he cocks his wrist on the backswing, and then decelerates into the ball. Remember the fact that your club face is open, the ball is going to go a lot higher, so therefore to reach your target, you've got to hit harder. Open the club face, give it a fair hit. This is a great little stroke saver if you can play the shot well. You can see when I'm hitting this shot, no deceleration at all. Nice crisp, crisp little shot, trying to get the ball up to the hole. It's a shot you should spend a lot of time just practicing. Now let me say this, if you move that ball back from the fringe, or from the green, or this little uh, nicely cut area into that fringe, now you're going to see quite a difference. Now the fact that the ball is lying low, the ball is going to come out with a lot of topspin. As you can see, that ball is rolling. Here we go again. This is a shot we often find ourselves in those little long fringes, two to three inches. Now we're going to hit the same shot, except the ball is going to come out with topspin. The reason being, if the ball is down so low, 
that you get grass between the club face and the ball. And that imparts this topspin. So play this shot like a semi-bunker shot. Aim just behind the ball, and you'll see the ball will come out like a bunker shot. When it's lying low like that in the grass, you cannot meet the ball first. It's impossible. So try and hit just behind the ball, like a bunker shot, and you see it comes out with that topspin. I'll give you a guarantee. If you watch your friends chipping, whether it's a run-up chip, whether it's a bunker shot, or whether it's a lofted chip, they'll be short of the pin eight out of 10 times. Make a little point, get by the hole, never up, never in. When you have a choice of playing a run-up chip or a lofted chip, keep it low. The low run-up is much easier than the lofted chip. Don't be embarrassed to use that Texas wedge, the old putter. A recap on the lofted chip. Your weight should be on your left side. The club face should be open. The ball should be opposite your left foot. Be sure to set your wrists early and accelerate through the ball. Points to remember, the chip from the fluffy lie. The club face should be open. Strike slightly behind the ball and do allow for a topspin with extra roll. We spend so much time on the green, most of the shots in golf are putts. So this is the way to lower your handicap, and here are some very good tips to help you hold the putts that you really want to make. Keep your cool on the golf course, folks. Don't get upset. You're going to have good times and you're going to have bad times. It doesn't matter who you are. I'd like to introduce you to Mimi, and we're going to show you a few things that she does wrong, and then try and correct her. And she should be a good putter because the best putters I've ever seen are the Japanese. I've never seen anybody putt so consistently well, even on korai grass, which is rough, not like the normal smooth bent. Get it? Okay, we saw that stroke now. Now, Mimi, what we want you to do, what Mimi did incorrectly there, folks, she had her left wrist at impact. It broke down. She was standing too far from the ball. So now we're going to change Mimi's stroke. We're going to get her to come closer to the ball so she can get her eye directly over the ball. We're going to make sure that her left wrist does not break down, that it moves together in one unit uh, with the club. Now, Mimi, if you'll come a little closer to the ball. Right, you had it out there. Now we want it much closer there. Don't move away. Your eye. Your eye must be directly over that ball. It's still not over the ball, you see? Bring your eye there. That's where your eye's got to be. That's right. Your eye's over it. Get your hands up a bit. Hold your club. Get your hands up. You had them too low, you see? So you're getting them up. Now, this is all going to work as one unit. You got that, Mimi? Mm -hmm. One unit. All right. Let's have a look at that now again. Okay. Hands are up. Your eye is over the ball. Now, you've got to keep your knees absolutely still. You don't move any part of your body except your, your arms and your hands, OK? OK, strike it. Much better. Look at that. There's the perfect wrist action, nice and straight with the club. In other words, you've got the perfect one movement there. These are the points I want you to remember when putting well. First of all, you notice we've taped that putter to my wrist. By taping it there, you cannot flip the wrists. You cannot break it down. Everything has got to go through in one unit. It's impossible for me to break that down. Do me a favor. Get yourself a roll of tape. Tape your arm against the putter like that. And I guarantee you, you'll get the feel very, very quickly. Place the right hand on there now. As I strike the putt now, I'm not aiming for any hole or anything. I'm just showing you that the left wrist doesn't break down. Look how it's gone through in one unit. The other point is, you've got to keep your legs, whether you like to stand shut, whether you like to stand open, or whether you like a wide stance or a narrow stance, is purely your choice. Be comfortable, be relaxed, don't have tension, be tension free in your putting stroke. I personally like to feel that my knees are a little bit locked, the same as Arnold Palmer is inclined to do. It keeps your legs still. Keep the head absolutely still as well. Your entire body must be still, except for your hands and your arms. Now, when placing the ball on the green, there's a special way to do it. You take the ball, 
and so that you can see that name on the actual ball. Now, when you're putting, you line up, you get the correct amount of strength in your mind, aim in the right line. Now, I'm standing with my eye directly over the ball. My legs are absolutely still as though they're in cement. This is all locked, as you can see. Now, keep my eye on the ball and see the putter actually strike the name of the ball before looking up. One of the biggest faults with all putters is before they hit the ball, they're moving their head. They're too anxious to see where the ball's going. Now, that sounds very easy, but I can assure you that if you want to putt well and really well, as these young pros do, you've got to spend at least one hour putting a day. And for some strange reason, the most important shot in golf is probably the putt. Although they say you drive for dough and putt for, you drive for show and you putt for dough, I've got to be honest that you drive for a lot of dough as well today. The competition is so great, you've got to do everything for dough. But I can assure you, there's no quicker way to lower your handicap than by becoming a good putter. See the putter strike the ball. Don't be in a hurry to look where it's going. Keep the legs still. And don't forget to tape that arm up so you can get that feeling of one unit throughout the ball. <laughs> it's all very well having a perfect putting stroke but you've got to have confidence in yourself and the only way you get confidence is by being on the green practicing those putts downhill uphill side hill against the grain with the grain and then you've got to visualize remember visualizing is important often when playing in a tournament if I can think of the most important putt that I probably ever hold in my life was at the masters on the 18th hole I hold the putt to win the Masters to beat Tom Watson, Hubert Green, and Rod Funseth. I had this 15-footer down the hill. I looked up at the scoreboard. I could see all their names. I knew I had to hold that putt to win, and I visualized the ball going in the hole. If I'd stood there and said to myself, well, I don't see any way to get this ball in the hole, as sure as God made little apples, you wouldn't get it in the hole. So visualize the shot, not only the putts. You should try and visualize all the shots that you play. Here's a recap on Gary's putting instructions. Choose a comfortable stance. Your weight should be on your left side. Keep your head and body as still as possible. Your knees should be slightly locked. Keep your eyes directly over the ball. Your left wrist should not break down. Keep your hands slightly up. Move your hands and arms in one unit and practice, practice, practice. After that last shot, I'm sure we might have your attention. We've shown you how to hook and how to slice. Now I'm going to hit three hooks for you and then three slices. Now we're going to show you three fades. I've really enjoyed doing this instructional tape for you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's helped your game just a little bit. If it has, tell your friends about it. And what I'd also like to say is, remember the important points. Just a little brainwashing here. We want to give you those important points to go over again so that you don't forget it. Something that might just lower your handicap by one or two strokes. The grip, a very important part. I have never seen a great player yet who had a bad grip. Nobody has ever played consistently well with a bad grip. The best grip that I can think of is make sure that that left thumb is slightly to the right-hand side of the shaft. 
this hand must run parallel to that hand. We don't want this hand over here fighting it, or this hand over there fighting it that way. The right hand must run parallel to the left hand. In other words, those lines formed by your index finger and your thumb, they must point to your right shoulder. Go to your pro. Have a checkup. Even if you check up every month on your grip, that might sound strange to you. But just like your teeth, you've got to look after that grip. If you don't have the right grip, you're in trouble. I've seen people come out there with this hand over there and that hand over there. They're fighting City Hall. To have a good stance and posture, I feel, is important. Just to go over the points briefly about the stance, with the short irons, you have a slightly open stance. With the medium irons, you stand square. And with your woods a little bit closed, which helps you to, enables you to have a good wind-up, a good turn. Obviously, when you stand open with the short irons, you don't need a good turn with the short irons. You need real accuracy, and that's a finesse shot. So remember those points. It's very important. You can have a good gun, but if you don't aim it at the target, the bullet ain't going there. We've mentioned the backswing, that so many people have so many different kinds of backswings. But if you watch the perfectionist, a man like Sam Sneed, he had tremendous tempo. He swung the club with great tempo, didn't rush it. If you swing slow, you get a nice big turn. If you swing fast, you will get jerky and you'll snatch. So start it back, one piece. Your hands and club all in one unit, which is going to give you a nice wide backswing and enable you and help you to turn better. And from there, you can release the club and go through into a good follow-through with balance. In my opinion, the single most important thing in the golf swing is the downswing. I've never seen anybody who's a great player, and I've never seen anybody who's even a reasonably good player that started the club down incorrectly. You'd have to be a magician to catch up. If you look at all the great players, they got to the top of their backswing and they pulled down that club. Actually, most of them pulled down with the left hand. Some might have pulled down with the right arm. Some might have started or initiated the downswing by using the hips or the knees. That's where you must see your pro and find out which suits you best. It's horses for courses. Some people haven't seen their knees in the last six years, so they cannot, obviously having a big stomach, they cannot use the legs that a young fit athlete can. Those are the people that have got to move the downswing or pull through with the hands more. Don't go fly fishing. Don't go casting from the top of your backswing. That will never get it. It's got to be a pulling motion. Very, very important. If I could say to a weekend golfer, practice your short game or practice your long game, there's no comparison. If you can devote one hour a day or 20 minutes a day to practice, three quarters of it should be with the short game and a quarter with a long game. It's the other way around with you golfers. You like to stand in the practice tee and hit a lot of long shots. I've seen a lot of people play real junk, real trash off the tee in their long game, and their putting and their short game was good, and they played well below their handicap. I've never seen anybody hit the ball well and chip and putt badly that played anywhere near their handicap. Spend more time on your short game. That's the thing that counts. Come out and do a little putting in the evenings or in the morning or putting on your carpet, or putting into a glass. The short game is the thing that really lowers the score. Course management, very, very important. I've seen so many players that I feel could have been great players had they had great course management. I think of great course management, I think of Jack Nicklaus. I think of Lee Trevino. So many of these fellas have got tremendous course management. They've got a great sense of playing the right shot at the right time. Don't worry if some guy in your club is out driving you by 50 yards. It doesn't mean all that much. You put the ball on the fairway. If you're playing from the old short stuff, you've got a better chance than the man who's playing from the long rough and the trees occasionally. When you hit the ball in the trees, don't try the miracle shot that Arnold Palmer used to play. You know, Arnold used to say there was 60% air and 40% leaves. Well, he was strong enough to knock the tree down. But get it back on the fairway. After all, you do get a stroke, you know. We don't get any. We have to take the gambles. You don't have to. To wrap it all up, I'd like to tell you a little story that might be of some help to you all. Chichi Rodriguez and my caddy rabbit and I were having a chat one day, 
and we were having a nice laugh about the swing, and Rabbit said to me, he says, Laddie, you've got to remember, you've got to swing slow to make the dough. He says, if you swing fast, you'll never last.